to Hashtag Webinar Wednesday. I'm Doug Susserman, and I'm privileged to serve as the CEO of Americans for Ben Gurion University. And we're so glad that you joined us today with Professor Ido Bar Zaev from Ben Gurion University of the Negative of the Negev, the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research. We're going to be talking about how Israel is leading the way in water renewal. So thank you. And uh, before we get too far into the program, this is a lead up webinar to our big virtual event on May the 1st, celebrating the remarkable two featuring climate saving science. Um, last year, we honored Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer at celebrating the remarkable one. And this year we're honoring the planet and talking about the incredible climate saving science work happening at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. So if you have not registered yet, just uh, click on the little slide, the QR code, and you'll be able to register for this free event. So thank you again for, for joining us. Also, we're close to one of my favorite holidays, Passover. So for those of you who are celebrating, have a Chag Kasher Pesach Sameach and a very enjoyable Passover um, in just a couple of days. It is noon Eastern time. I'm in my virtual office in New York City and Professor uh, Ido Barzaev is in Israel at 7 p.m. there. So welcome, Ido. Thank you very much. So okay. let me share my screen. Yeah, just real quickly before we do that, I just wanna thank everybody um, for joining us and also Ali Robinson, and Liz Kirshner for all their work behind the scenes and getting us set up for this for this important webinar. All right, I've got a little bio. Ido doesn't like when his bio is shared, but he's really a great expert in water research, and so I wanted to tell you about him. Um, Ido is a, is an associate professor at the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. He is an applied environmental microbiologist who focuses on a wide spectrum of water issues during, as we know, an era of global climate change and severe water scarcity. His interdisciplinary interests include the nexus of desalinization industry and the aquatic environment, the role of marine and freshwater aggregates in various biochemical cycles. There will be a quiz at the end of this webinar and um, biofouling from biofilm formation on various artificial surfaces. Professor Barzaev received his PhD in microbiology from bar -Ilan University and his postdoc from the Department of Environmental and Chemical Engineering at a little known university in the States called Yale. Welcome, Ido. So I think you were gonna start, I think you were gonna start with a uh, presentation. I'm also just being reminded to thank the Water Institute of the Gulf in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who's one of our partners in um, in producing this webinar. Thank you, Ido. Take it from here. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, I would like to start and say it is a slideshow. However, uh, if you feel the urge to ask a question, you can try. We can definitely in a few minutes uh, stop the floor for any of your questions. So you can write it also to yourself or send it through the chat. Yeah, so okay. people are, uh, the, the, this, warrant, this webinar is called for 30 minutes. Ida is gonna give a presentation, but if you do have a question, try to submit them through the Q&A function and I'll get those questions to Ido. I see some questions already coming in on gray water reuse uh, via the chat. But try to submit your questions via Q&A. Go ahead, Ido. Okay, so the, the big topic today is how Israel is leading the way in water renewal. And I'll try to, to tell you a story. So personally myself, um, I was always sure that our globe is blue. This is what people told me. Uh, really quickly, I understood it's not this kind of a waterly world. And 
when you think really about it, it's really linked to this climate change we're all facing and the global water crisis. So on the y-axis of this plot, you can see the increase in change. And overall, population is rising. Everybody feels it. The big problem is that the natural water uh, availability is basically stays the same and in some areas actually dwindling. So already today, we're facing a fairly severe water withdrawal in a global scale. And in, very, in the near, near future, this will become as a water crisis. We start feeling it already today in certain places. You would think that Africa or the African continent with a lot of uh, low income developing countries will face that water shortage. However, it's not just like that. Today in the States, and I assume part of you are coming from these areas, are facing a huge, terrible water drought. It starts from um, uh, California and goes inland. Already a lot of vineries have to cut short and dry their crops. I think, and I, I must say it's not just me, it's me and many other that global efforts to minimize this water shortage must be prioritized. However, you, you can think of what here in Israel we're doing. Us, we're trying to learn from our past and develop at the same time our future. If you look a little bit backwards, this is how Israel looked like in the 40s and 50s of the previous century. We have been dependent, heavily dependent, on natural water, on the natural water cycle where we pumped water from the aquifer or from the Sea of Galilee. Interestingly, this is a mem or these are members of the UN Commission of Inquiry that visited us here in the Negev in Revivim, where they try to estimate our capacity to make food. Based on that, based on the water that came to Revivim, the entire southern border of Israel was decided. A wise man said, just hear it from our campus here in Steboker, that it is in the Negev that the creativity and pioneer vigor of Israel shall be tested. And we are definitely trying to do that today. However, if we are shooting in towards the 20th century, our natural freshwater inputs are about 1.3 billion cubic meters per year. However, our demand mostly goes to agriculture and home use is between 1.5 to 2 billion cubic meters per year. You do not need to be a great mathematician to understand that we have a yearly deficit of 200 to 670 million cubic meters per year from this natural water cycle. You need to think what is the natural water cycle and almost every kid knows it. It's basically rain, some evaporation, some of the water infiltrate and we can draw it back. Some will be lost to runoff that goes to the ocean. In Israel, we pushed hard on reuse and recycle of water, some of it as gray water. We are trying to reduce consumption by hips. Uh, storm water is still an issue. We are capturing it, but not in a huge efficiency. Nonetheless, this is just a sustainable water cycle. It's not in enlarging the fresh water cycle. The only way to increase this fresh water inventory is through seawater reverse osmosis desalination, basically removing all sorts of minerals and make water fresh. I think one of the things that makes us above uh, other places or other arid places in the world is that we think ahead. Already in the beginning of the 2000s, 
when we understood that we we're going to go into this water crisis, we decided, Israel decided, not to depend on natural freshwater sources, but instead develop seawater reverse osmosis desalination. Already in 2005, we constructed the largest desalination facility in the world, producing about 150 million cubic meters per year. Today, the end of 2021, freshwater production in Israel is more than 650 million cubic meters per year, which is about 75% of what all Israelis drink. You should ask yourself that what statistic what, one more time. 75% of all water of usage 75 at home. 75% of what Israelis drink mm -hmm. and use for home use is through seawater reverse osmosis desalination. Basically, 75% of what Israelis drink is coming from the sea. This is what it means. Phenomenal statistic. Do you know what the, the next leading country is? Well, I should say that there are countries in the Gulf that uh, drink 100% uh, from the sea, like uh, the Emirates, for example. Israel will become like that in about five years. I will discuss it when we are talking uh, different strategies. However, I think it's a very important question to ask. Uh, there are things that should be reminded when we are drinking only desalinated water regarding minerals that are missing. For example, you would be missed iodide and magnesium, which are important. The question is where will you get it from, whether from the water or maybe from your eating bread. This is a strategical question that will be answered in years to come here in Israel. However, back into desalination, to me it was not trivial what desalination is. I know that thermal distillation is very easy to explain because everybody has a kettle in their home. So if you boil um, seawater, you evaporate it, you can condensate that, and then use the product as fresh water. The problem is it's not efficient. And Doug, if you asked about uh, leading countries in desalination, the Emirates are doing exactly that. They have a lot of energy in the form of oil and they are transforming it to fresh water. In Israel, we decided to go on a more efficient way. And this is through reverse osmosis desalination which is basically a membranal process. And I'll explain. Osmosis in uh, later happens inside all of us, meaning fresh water is passed through a semi-permeable membrane. Do not be alarmed of this term. It's basically like a plastic bag that passes only water, no salts, only water. And this water is passed towards the salty solution, basically to equilibrate concentrations. At the natural process, energy is produced. The problem is that we're losing fresh water. Instead, we want to do reverse osmosis, go against nature. And if we go against nature, we must supply energy. We supply energy to squeeze water out of salty solutions, reject the salt, and drink the fresh water. I want to pause. Sidney Lau, he was, or I should say Professor Sidney Lau, he was, um, he was taught, or well, born and raised in the States, taught in UCLA, and one of the forefathers of reverse osmosis. In 67, he came to Beersheba to teach reverse osmosis in BGU. It was not BGU, BGU yet, but later it has become the BGU that we know today. Without him, reverse osmosis or desalination as we know it will not, would not be 
uh, applied. But back to reverse osmosis. And if you know, we're, we're, taking... getting, we're getting some questions around the risks, you know, that the minerals and salts are left in the ocean and what, what is the environmental risk from that? So in terms of getting all the minerals out, it cannot happen because it's a cycle. Um, one thing that we are working a lot on is, you know what, dwell with me on this question for about 20 seconds, okay? Because when you think about the process and you take seawater, half of it we drink, but half of it is rejected back to the ocean as concentrated brine. My group specifically works a lot on this impacts of this brine discharge back to the ocean. At this point, what we found out that the impact is fairly local, meaning about one to two kilometers around the outfall of the desalination facilities. You can ask yourself if it's important or not, and it's a full half an hour discussion at least. I can talk for that on days, but overall the impact at this point is known to be fairly local. I hope I answered. Um, but I think this is another issue that, that we need to think as a society. This process compared to natural processes cost energy and energy cost money. So I, I like to play this game and it's much better in person than on Zoom. But overall, the, the big question is how much time will one cubic meter, about 250 gallons of fresh water, will last for a normal family, two parents, two kids regarding genders? I can tell you that it's about, Doug, what do you think? How much time? I have no idea. Guess, a week, two weeks, one month, two months. A week. A week. You are not far, far away from that. It's between three to five days, according to the Israeli uh, statistical uh, surveys. This, uh, this one cubic uh, meters cost about 3.5 kilojoules per hour. And I assume to you, also to me, it's a vague term. So if I'm trying to connotate, to try to uh, simulate what 3.5 kilowatt per hour will, uh, will be worth. It's one lowing machine or one hour of air condition. Could be uh, 30 kilometers, 14 miles with an electric car. So now when you think about what is more important, three to five days of water for my family or driving 30 kilometers, this put that in perspective. However, if you want it as specific um, uh, quotes, to produce about one cubic meter of fresh water by desalination will cost less than $1, between 63 to 96 cents. A lot of you, I'm sure, are asking yourself or your partners, why shouldn't we draw it from the aquifer? In Israel, it costs 20 cents if you're in Long Island or Connecticut, it's basically zero. The question is what will happen if you do not have it, if it's dry. You cannot suddenly construct a desalination facility. It takes time. In Israel specifically, we have five desalination facilities. Um, from the north to the south, they are producing, as I said, more than 650 million cubic meters per year. 75, as Doug highlighted, of what we drink. There are two other construct, uh, other large-scale desalination uh, facilities that are uh, being um, in the verge of constructing. One in the north, next to Akko, and one in the south, next to Tel Aviv. In the near future, about a few years from now, Israelis will be fully dependent on desalination technology. hundred percent of what we'll drink, if that's the case, we need to think 
of our threats. What are the threats or uprising threats to this technology if we're going to be dependent on it? Doug, I would like to stop now to answer some questions and then we can continue on the threats. I'll okay. stop my so, sharing. Again, we have questions that are building in the Q&A function, but for the audience, if you have questions, uh, just, just click on the Q&A function. We have one that's not related to, to desalinization, but it's very interesting around that there are Israeli researchers, this is coming from Stuart Karlinsky, trying to produce water from the air. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that technology and how viable or expensive it is? So this technology of condensation, let's say, is definitely not new. Uh, if you go to the Atacama, uh, desert, just on the border between the sea and the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, you'll find for many years they have fences that uh, collect the dough, uh, the moisture from the air. What is, uh, what is interesting with what science, Israeli scientists have done, and I think that is the novelty, is compact that technology into something that is they do not uh, uh, acquire a lot of space. Um, the concept again is very simple. You see it on your windows every day, I, was, I would assume. The, the, the main uh, patents in that is how to condense the technology and makes, make it available. These days, this is what uh, researchers are doing using nanomaterials that enhance the efficiency of condensation and surface uh, surface properties. Thank you. We got a, an interesting question from Alexander Morris, who's asking about oil spills that are near desalinization plants. How does that affect the water? So I, I would like to wait for that because I have uh, that's exactly these uprising threats, and I think oil is the greatest one. So bear with me about seven minutes from now, from once I start. <laughs> okay. And then we're getting a few different questions around, you mentioned that the effects from the brine aren't large in total, but what about localized near the plants themselves? So localized, I think this is a very interesting story. Um, in terms of localized, uh, especially benthic organisms were found to be affected or heavily affected. These could be seagrasses that act as nurseries for small fish and larvae. Um, one big, big topic that we are working today, if you'll invite me to a webinar next year, I'll have much more insights. Uh, and that's related to coral reefs. Uh, at this point, uh, specifically, super large desalination facilities are being constructed in Aqaba, Jordan, uh, to provide the Jordanians with fresh water. And we have big, big questions on what will occur to the coral reefs in Eilat on the Red Sea due to the brine discharge. Um, again, it's a, it's a big, big story. And uh, I don't know if we have time to dwell like deeply on the details about it. One of our board members, Michael Ozer, is asking about the safety difference between desalinization and sort of uh, recycled or reuse, water reuse, gray water? Those are two, two different things. In terms, of, uh, in terms of Israeli regulation, we cannot drink recycled uh, water. It can be used for irrigation in some degrees. Again, also depends on how good you treat the water, meaning if it's uh, secondary effluent or tertiary effluent which type of uh, um, crops you can um, use, for, use that for irrigation. But Israeli uh, law do not uh, allow for direct portable use. So desalination at this point is the only option for, uh, for us Israelis uh, to use for drinking. My understanding is that uh, Israel does reuse something like over 80% of its Gray water, but only for agricultural use. That's correct. 
Correct. It's about uh, these days, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it's between 84 to 85 percent um, of what we we use we recycle for uh, for irrigation. But again, that is only irrigation. You cannot use it for for other applications. Okay, great. And Ido, we. Uh... Congratulations, you kind of set maybe a webinar record for the number of questions that are being asked. So we're never going to get through all of them. And to the so, audience, we'll, we'll do our best to um, actually write up some of these answers uh, working with Ido and get them to uh, our participants. But Ido, I know there was another sort of topic you wanted to, dis to discuss a little bit. Yeah, it would be fairly brief. Um, but I think it's really important to, for people to understand, also to, to convey the message. So when you think about the threats, you need to, you need to dwell a little bit on what it means and, and why is it a threat. So if you think this, is, this schematic as desalination facility, again, you, you draw water from the sea, you pre-treat it, you have to remove the big stuff, the organic material, so it will not clog these membrane sheets, these plastic bags. Then we desalinate the water and use it. The problem is that just if you look into this cartoon, this is the membrane. If we have things that are growing on this membrane, the freshwater production basically drops. We cannot allow it because we need the water. So we have to push this, uh, this pressure. We have to pressurize this biofilm, this bacteria, the organic material that deposited on the membrane. We have to press them hard to squeeze the water and boost the production. This high pressure or increased pressure costs a lot of money. And in desalination, for the desalination industry, in most cases, they will halt production. So what they do is they treat the water with this type of dual media filtration. Well, it captures all the organic material so it will not end up on these membranes. When these big uh, filters are clogged, it is backwashed and all the material go back to the ocean. However, the question is what happens when you have sewage outbursts going into the ocean that feeds these desalination facilities or jellyfish swarms around the, out, uh, the intake ports or as somebody asked, oil spills, all of these organic inputs highlight the question on what would be the impact on our Israeli freshwater production. What, one of the things we found is that these sewage outbursts result in spur, uh, it spur bacterial growth. And these pass these pretreatment uh, systems. We do hold desalination, freshwater production as a constant because it's an asset. However, what happens is that we have to increase the pressure the desalination facilities, in this case, halt production. So there are times in a year that production is stopped. If we are totally dependent on seawater reverse osmosis desalination, we cannot let it happen. The same goes, or similarly, with this type of jellyfish. They, again, spoil this bacterial growth However, they also release a lot of organic material, also passing these pretreatment stages. So what you can see on a membrane are these large chunks of jellyfish, as well as a lot of bacteria that grow and feed on that. However, they're clogging the membranes. So they are decreasing the pretreatment efficiency and dramatically increase operating and cost of the desalination facilities. Finally, I have to finish with these oil spills. Recently, we had a 
I would say a small oil spill in the Mediterranean, about 30 kilometers offshore, where models show how it ended up on our coast. Obviously, it also ended up in the desalination facilities. However, it was small. It raised a big, big question. One, will it be drawn into the desalination facilities? It is known, and I'm sure you're asking or telling your partners that oil is often floating on the sea, so it will not end up uh, inside the intake ports. However, it was shown that derivatives will end up inside. More importantly, these oils that end up inside the pretreatment procedure will clog these sand filters. To replace a sand filter takes six months. So halting production for six months. I think a big question is how much is passing? And if it's passing, what will happen when it's on the membrane? And if it's on the membrane, will we drink it? Will it pass the membrane? All of those things are unknown. Uh, here in BGU, we're working hard on developing different strategies to mitigate that. Because at this point, the main strategy is to close the faucet, halt production. Obviously, if we drink 100% of what we produce through desalination, this is a problematic option. In BGU, in my lab and others, we're trying to formulate and develop smart barriers that passes only water, seawater, but holds the, the oils, for example, or even modified membranes that will withstand oil that is coming through the desalination process. I think if you ask why Israel became a, a water superpower, you can read that book. I think it's good by Seth Siegel, Let There Be Water. However, if you look into it, I think that one of the things that is already coined is that we build the largest seawater reverse osmosis desalination. More importantly, I think that we are leaders in desalination innovation. I think it's more important than actually producing the water. I did not have the time to discuss how are we doing in terms of adv advanced wastewater treatment. However, we are first in the world by far. We are uh, reusing about 83 to 84% of what we produce. Doug, if you would ask, number two is Spain with 14%. Finally, I think it's very important that we put pinpoint education on water saving. And as well, it starts at young age, saying to kids that you cannot take a bath. When you wash your dishes, you first scrape and then wash it. It comes from an early age. Still, and to finalize, you can ask yourself, why Israel is a water trailblazer? I think my answer is really, really easy. We see water as, an astra as a strategical asset. And I think this, if you ask me in the beginning what makes us different from other countries, I think that is it. All the rest is the tactics that let us, uh, or that helps us with this notion that water is an, that is an a strategy. With that, I would like to finish and invite you all to our International Water Summit at Sdeboker, uh, where we're trying, hopefully succeeding, to provide a global vision on water for the, for the 21st century. With that, I would like to thank you um, and the audience, and obviously to our forefathers and the people that are moving us forward in terms of water and water strategy. Thank you all. Thank you, Ido. So that was phenomenal. And by the way, even though we've gone a few minutes over our 30 minutes, the audience has held and the questions keep growing. Mm -hmm. So if I can, can I ask you one, one or two more questions? 
for sure from my end. Okay, okay great. So Irene Skolnick's asking, are there storage facilities of water in Israel for when the desalinization plants are shut down or not working? So yes, it's kind of hard to think about it as a storage uh, facility, but at this point, the Sea of Galilee will be as such. The Sea of Galilee in terms of a strategic asset would be the storage facility for water if we have uh, a catastrophic event. However, it needs to be understood that, for example, in terms of an oil spill, it would be hard for Israel to withstand uh, without desalination for a few years. So it is true that we do have some storage capacity in the aquifers and in the Sea of Galilee, but definitely we need to find and think ahead on how to deal with these type of threats to the desalination industry. Thank you. Last question is uh, around the energy source for the desalinization plants. So at this point, like it started a few years ago with coal, uh, very quickly it moved to natural gas, which is um, much greener. Obviously it's not a green or a sustainable uh, platform, but at this point, um, it's really hard to go fully renewable. Um, to the best of my understanding, there's no large scale desalination facility that is using renewable energy. Um, obviously in the desalination facilities themselves, they do have solar, but it's not for uh, water production. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we're gonna close this webinar uh, to the audience, thank you for, for participating. And Ido is a fabulous presentation. We're getting a lot of compliments in the chat and the Q&A function on the Zoom. Uh, don't forget to join us on May the 1st for Celebrating the Remarkable Two, Climate Saving Science, um, which is our big virtual event. So again, if you haven't yet signed up, just point your phone at the QR code and you can register. The event is for free. Uh, David Van Gurian, the founder of Israel, first prime minister and namesake of our university, once said that it is in the Negev that the Jewish scientific talent and ability for research will be tested. And thanks to people like Professor Ida Bardzaev, I think we've, we've risen to that challenge that, that Van Gurian put in front of us. He also said that if Israel could succeed in desalinating water, that it would bring a great blessing to the entire human race. And we're very proud of the work at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research, the, the Jacob Blaustein's Institute for Desert uh, Science and Research, all at our incredible Stebo Care campus uh, in the middle of the Negev Desert where Ido lives. We live on the Midrasha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So to the audience, if you, if you, uh, haven't been to Israel in a little while, it's time to go now. And when you go to Israel and you want to imagine the future, come visit Ben Gurion University of the Negev, because if you haven't spent time in the Negev, you really haven't seen the future of Israel. And until you really understand Ben Gurion University, um, you haven't seen the engine that's driving the growth of the future of Israel. So thank you once again for joining us. Happy Passover. Stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Edo.